following is a production of the Department of Broadcasting and Journalism at Western Illinois University. Democratic Party. I'm sitting here with Rich Egger and Good Emily evening. Manley. I know we're all quite excited to see this. This is the Democratic one, so we're expecting to see some big names, primarily Hillary Clinton, and some up-and-comers. Bernie Sanders, I know, is kind of really... I have to start out with saying, you know, Joe Biden yesterday. Um, I was quite... I have to say I was shocked. You know, I really thought he was going to run for presidency, and, you know, he made it known that even though he's not going to run, he's still going to be very spoken. Yeah, I was not as surprised by his announcement. He's taken a long time to think about it. He had the, the death of his son. I, I'm sure he's still grieving. And, and this is such a big undertaking, and it's really getting late in the game for someone to just jump in at this point. Yeah, I would have to agree. Even though his son, I know, was known for having him, wanting him to join in the presidential uh, campaign and everything, I think it was just too much at the time for him to really take forward. And like Red Tiger said, it was, it's pretty late in the game now. The Iowa caucuses are starting up soon, so it's, his campaign would be kind of late in trying to put his name out there. Uh, I have to say, I also found this interesting. Trump was in Iowa last night, Burlington, Iowa, which is not far from here. And he said, you know, I'm okay with Biden not wanting, running. He wants to run against Hillary. You know, he made that known. I want to, I want to run against Hillary. I don't care about Biden. I'm glad that he's kind of out of the system. And I, I got a kick out of that. Well, he needs to win his party's nomination before he gets a chance to run against anyone, and there's still a long way to go on that. That's true. Tonight we had the Republican uh, caucus and primary, and uh, Mr. Bush took that by quite the, uh, a number of votes. I was pretty shocked at that as well. Uh, Trump was the next one uh, to come in second there, but he was behind by over 150 votes. So uh, definitely looks like this is, for the most part, a Bush campus. Well, uh, uh, Jeb Bush recorded a uh, promo for this event. He's the only Republican candidate who did that. That may have helped him out. That may have won him some support uh, in the mock presidential election. I have to agree. Before we go any farther and start this evening, I want to remind you that you can follow along with the mock presidential election on social media. The official hashtag of the event is hashtag WIUM. P, I'm sorry, W-I-U-M-P-E, as you see on the screen right now. You can find us on the Facebook page, uh, WIU Mock Presidential Election, and you can find the web page. Uh, that's what we're using this evening. It has the candidates on it, the schedule. Uh, tonight will go from 8 to 10 p.m., and as I said earlier, the Republicans are already done. We This is the Democrats. We will be back on Tuesday, and that is the National Convention. So, you know, uh, big night tonight. Once again, we're going to get started here in a little bit with uh, WIU Color Guard. Uh, Rich, I kind of want to know your thoughts on this uh, Democratic Party that we're going to hear from this evening. What sort of thoughts would you like to know about <laughs> the Democratic Party? Okay, who who do you think is going to, you know, this is a college campus. What do you think is going to bring what college kids want to hear to the table? Well, I think we've seen Bernie Sanders has really energized young voters so far uh, during the campaign. Certainly, uh, Hillary Clinton is highly qualified to hold the office. She's been a first lady, she's been a U.S. Senator, she's been Secretary of State. She certainly has all the qualifications. The question is, is she able to connect with the voters? And uh, uh, since you're both college students, do you feel she is going to be able to connect with you? I think she has gonna, is going to have some trouble doing that, just because, you know, even though she has a name in politics, it was kind of before our time, so we have no uh, real connection with, you know, her husband and her run as first lady. And um, I think she's also just kind of had struggle with uh, trying to find people to trust her with, you know, the whole email and Benghazi problems. I think people really don't really have any confidence in what Hillary can bring to the table. Anna Malay, we heard that from someone just uh, yesterday or this morning. I don't remember when it was. We were talking to someone. I don't want to name them. And I asked this person, if, if Trump is the Republican presidential candidate, would you vote for him? And he kind of hemmed and hawed on that. But the one the caveat was, if uh, Hillary Clinton is the Democratic nominee, he would vote for Trump. That's all that we have for right now. We're going to send it back to the stage here as we start the Democratic State, or I'm sorry, caucus and primary.
the caucuses and primaries for the Democratic Party as part of the Western Illinois University mock presidential election, the largest college-based simulation in the country. The first order of business is the presentation of the colors by members of the WIU ROTC Brigade and the singing of the national anthem by members of the university singers. If you would please rise, gentlemen, remove your caps and please remain standing until the colors have left the hall. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. I believe I saw Mr. Trotter, who was the <laughs> I did see him, and he's all the way in the back of the uh, room coming up here. Mr. Trotter is the chairman of the McDonough County uh, Democrats. Well, good. See, so we like to do this without giving you any warning. Uh, let him say a few words. This is the same Mr. Trotter didn't know he was supposed to speak tonight, so I apologize for taking a couple of minutes of your time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being engaged. It's been a long time since uh, we've been here. You're, it's, it's so apt. This is the uh, road to the White House. You're going to meet Congressman, former Congressman Hare. Just a minute. He, uh, he brought a gentleman two doors, two rooms away here a few years ago by the name of Barack Obama, who wanted to be a senator. And then uh, he wanted to go on to be president. It does start here. It does start at Westford. It starts with you. I'm very excited that, uh, that, that you're inter interested in it. Uh, we're going to need some good college Democrats for the election next year. Those of you who would be interested in helping us this spring or this fall, please see me. I'll be in the back of the room. Thank you. Good luck. And thank you for being engaged. My name is, is John Hemingway, and I've been working with uh, particularly cantankerous character named Dr. Rick Hardy on this kind of project for more years than we can count. So I'm going to introduce Rick so that he can give you an overview of the rules 
that we're going to be following tonight, the procedures, um, you will be in uh, actually deciding uh, votes that will be cast on Tuesday uh, for the, the candidate. So Rick, if you want to come up here and um, give people your version of it. All right, first of all, are there any Democrats in here? I don't think I heard that. Are there any Democrats in here? All right, that's better. Well, good evening, I'm Rick Hardy, and uh, tonight we, uh, we're gonna talk about the uh, primaries and the caucuses. Uh, before I do, uh, Dr. Keith Balkelman reminds me that we're putting out a survey, a public opinion survey of the students at Western Illinois You'll soon be seeing it uh, appear on your emails. Uh, we'd appreciate if you take a little time and fill that out. We'd like to know how you feel about things that are going on. I know we've already done one before the simulation started, but we want to keep tabs of that. So please help us out with that. We'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, tonight, what we are doing is simulating uh, the, the beginning of the process, and that is you're going to be going, you're either in a caucus state or a primary state. Now, in order to become president, you have to go to your convention with the most votes or most delegates to the convention. And in order to get those, it's up to each state to, to set the rules for getting those delegates. For example, in the state of Iowa, you have a caucus. Uh, that means that in February, actual February, this next year, voters across the state will be going to, in this case, your Democratic caucuses. It could be in somebody's home, it could be in a, it could be in a library, it could be in a church. And the people would get there and they would discuss the issues, they discuss the candidates that were running for president, and then they have to make a decision. And normally what they do is they have people stand up and say, all of you for Hillary, please go over here. All of you for Bernie Sanders, please go over here. All of you for Martin O'Malley, over here, and so on. And in their case, they, you would have to have at least 15% of the delegates in that room. If you don't, you could either go home or join some other one. And this process goes on. And it's a very open process, and it's one that allows people at the grassroots to determine what they want. Right after that, they go to New Hampshire. New Hampshire has a primary. That's just like an election that people who are registered Democrats would go to the polls and they would have a secret ballot. And in that secret ballot they cast and then they determine how many delegates each person is going to get. And you continue with that until you get to the, onto the convention. The goal is to win one half plus one of the delegates to the convention. If you do, you become the nominee of your party. And then you go up against the uh, candidates of, the, in this case, the Republican and other, other parties. So earlier tonight, the Republicans had theirs. You're having your process. And later next week, we'll have the Greens and the Libertarians and so on. So it's part of a process. And we want your vote to count. And we want you to vote as though you were a person in that state you vote the way you think that person from your state would vote, a typical voter. And of course, there are many factors that go into that. So that's the process. And uh, by the way, we're going to be sending out some attendance sheets, sign-in sheets. I don't know if we've started that yet. And if you haven't signed in, there'll be a sign-in sheet. Make sure your name's on there. We'll also have a sign-out sheet. And that won't take place until after we vote. So tonight, I hope you enjoy what we have. And I'm going to begin by uh, introducing our keynote speaker tonight, and it's a distinct pleasure. Uh, he's actually my boss because he's the uh, member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, that's the highest ranking people here, and, uh, and uh, of course, we're always glad to have uh, somebody involved at a high level be part of what we're doing here. Phil Hare, I'm sure that's a household word uh, name around here. Phil Hare uh, was uh, born in, in Galesburg, uh, raised in Rock Island, graduated from Alleman High School, went on to graduate from Blackhawk College, and then he got involved in the workplace and he rose to become the president of his local union. 
He got active in the Democratic Party, and in 1980, he actually went to the Democratic National Convention as an alternate delegate uh, for uh, Ted Kennedy. Um, eventually, he would meet up with uh, Lane Evans, who decided he was going to run uh, for Congress against Tom Railsback, a man that had been in office uh, 16 years and no one thought could ever get beat. But with Phil's help, Lane Evans managed to win. He went to Congress. And for the next 24 years, um, Phil Hare served as his right-hand person. He became his expert, really, on many constituents' issues and in anything dealing with employment or unions. He was the man that everyone went to. In 2006, unfortunately, um, Wayne Evans fell ill. And uh, that created a seat, and there was an election. And I can recall this to this day when Phil decided to run for the seat uh, vacated by his previous, by his boss. He ran against Andrea Zynga. The reason I remember that is because I was the moderator of that debate. I don't know, Phil, if you remember that or not. And I was so impressed by the way you handled yourself and that you were really super prepared on those issues that night. And I could see why you won that election and a subsequent election. Um, today, uh, Phil is, as I mentioned, uh, a distinguished member on the board of trustees. He's really kind of the person who makes the ultimate decisions, policymaker for our university. Uh, he and his wife, Becky, uh, live in Rock Island. They have two grown uh, children. And um, we're just proud to have him here tonight. So please give a warm welcome to our former congressman, our trustee, Phil Hare. Give it up for him, guys. Come on. He's our man. All right. I think Rick needs to get a little more excited. Uh, but I, I thank you for that wonderful introduction. And let me just say that um, uh, I am a trustee here. So tonight, I have to remove my trustee hat and, because I am going to be talking about politics, primarily democratic politics. And I don't want the two to conflict. So anything I'm saying comes from me as a person, not me as a trustee at the university. Um, on the way down here, I was thinking, well, what do I want to talk about? And by the way, when I get done, I hope there's maybe some questions or some comments. But on the way down here, I was thinking about, you know, how, what, am I going to, what do I want to talk about? These are Democrats. And I thought, well, the difference is in the parties. Well, I think we kind of know that, except uh, if you've been watching the debates, ours, we've had one. The other side has had, I don't know how many. Uh, too many because my stomach is just upset and up. But if you listen to the rhetoric coming out of those debates, here are the issues that I believe define who we are as a party and what our friends on the other side are. By the way, I'm not here tonight to bash Donald Trump. He does that on his own. But... But I am here to give you what I believe are fundamental differences. For example, in the Republican debate, there was no discussion, zero that I recall, uh, about equal pay for women in the workplace. They make, women make, I believe it's 71 or something like that, cents on the dollar compared to what men make. But that wasn't brought up in the Republican debate. It was in the Democratic debate. There was no talk at all about climate change in the Republican debate. I don't know if they need to get hit with an iceberg or what has to happen to these people to realize that every scientist worth their salt has said that we have a sincere problem with this issue and it is man-made and to ignore it means that your generation and the generation after that are going to have to pay a tremendous tremendous price for inactivity. During their debate, I found it interesting that immigration did come up. Now this, by the way, was a party that after their defeat with Romney got together and said, what do we need to do? Uh, we just got hammered. Well, we need to do three or four things. One is we have to reach out to the Latino vote because 
to win the Republican, for a Republican to win the presidency, you have to get at least 40 to 43 percent of their Hispanic vote. The second thing is, I said, we need to be gentler with people from the LGTB community. And we need to be more inclusive on women's issues. Well, let's start with the immigration thing. We've already mentioned the equal pay and a number of other things. The wall. We've got one candidate that not only wants to build a wall around Mexico, they want to build one around Canada. That is the most absurd thing I have ever heard of in my life. You have one candidate that wants to build it and then tell Mexico they're going to pay for it. And when asked, well, what are you going to do if the president of Mexico says we're not going to pay? Well, we'll make him pay. Well, how are you going to do that? It's not going to happen. And then this, this candidate says, but we're going to open this, we're going to have this huge fence, but we're going to have a beautiful door so that everybody that we throw out, which is everybody, those that we shouldn't have, we're going to let them back in through this beautiful door. How kind of that party. But none of them, none of them had the courage in their debate to talk about comprehensive immigration reform. Have they heard of the Fourth Amendment? You know, they're so quick to talk about the Second Amendment, but they don't want to talk about the Fourth Amendment. They want to take kids who were born here, and they want to deport them and bring them back in. How kind and gentle of a party is that? Look, I don't want to see convicted felons enter this country illegally. And I think we need a comprehensive immigration policy that allows people the opportunity to apply for citizenship legally. But you demonize people, to demonize a group of people who are here and to think that where we can get the money for this, by the way, even if it was a brilliant idea, which I think it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. But where were you going to get the money to do that? And how does that reach out to the Hispanic community? What does it say? You have name calling on the other side. One candidate says one candidate's ugly. He says that the wife of another presidential candidate is not very attractive. He has the gall the gall to say that John McCain, who is of the other party, was not a war hero after seven and a half years in a prison camp in Hanoi, tortured, is not a hero. He's not a war hero. And yet, you have people that buy into this, this nonsense. And I would have thought that every time somebody said something like that, I ran for office, if I'd have said anything like any of those things, I wouldn't have made it two terms much, uh, I wouldn't have made it one term much less two. But the fact of the matter remains is this is the party, the, the differences in our party. Now, I will, in, in fairness, tell you that I support um, Bernie, Senator, Senator Sanders. I serve with him. But, but did you hear during the debate? during the debate, at least Hillary and Bernie and some of our other friends on stage talked about Social Security. Look, the answer to solving Social Security is not to make people work longer, and it's not to make them get, it's not to freeze what they're getting, which is just what we've done. There are seniors that live in this very district, perhaps your grandparents or your parents, that live for this money. It's all they have. So why do we take and take the amount of 100 and I believe it's $18,000 and you stop paying on it. When I was in Congress, I made $174,000. Pretty good money. But why was I cut off at 118? I mean, that's like cheating the taxpayers. I wanted to pay the, and my, my colleagues told me they thought I was crazy. And I said, well, wait a second, I'm paying at 118, and the remaining $56,000, I'm not paying anything on. If we did this, and I had the Social Security people come to my office, we would fund Social Security fully until the year 2075. But heaven forbid that we would want to talk about people having to pay a little bit extra on what they make. So let's just make older people have to get less or retire when they, or not retire when they want to retire. 
And lastly, let me just say, there's so many issues on health care. The night of the health care vote in Congress, we passed it by three votes. My pollster told me that afternoon, he said, Phil, if you vote for this bill, you're going to get beat. There's a lot of misinformation that was put out, and I blame our party, candidly, for not being good messengers. And when I do a, I told the president when I met with him, I know him well, and I said, with all due respect, Mr. President, if I'm doing a town hall meeting with 200 people, and I'm sitting there trying to talk about health care for all, and I start getting into uh, exchanges and all this other kind of stuff, people are looking at me like, I don't even know part of, part of, part of this stuff. But the fact of the matter is, this is a country where health care ought to be a right for every American and not a privilege. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. When my granddaughter was born, <laughs> when my granddaughter was born at a day and a half, they found out that her aorta was collapsed and she was airlifted from Moline to Peoria and was on the operating table for four and one half hours. And she made it. How lucky. But I, I met two, three, three things on this health care thing, because I think it's huge. First of all, I agree with Senator Sanders. We ought to have a Medicare for all people. And if you want to buy a supplemental policy, then you buy a supplemental policy. You don't have to, you, don't, you can go out in the marketplace and buy whatever you want to buy. But from cradle to grave, look at Medicare. I don't see any any party going around talking about, we've got to get rid of Social Security, Medicare, and veterans' benefits. So, hey, we've got, got to do away with those. Because they know the minute they touch that, they're out of office. For heaven's sakes, we couldn't do that. But I had a woman that went to high school with me, and she said, Congressman, I have a question for you. And I said, well, just call me Phil. And she says, no, you're my congressman, and I want you to give me your honest opinion. I only have enough money to make my house payment or my health insurance payment. What do I do? And I looked at her and I said, that is not a decision you should have to make. And we're going to do the best that we can do to make sure that you don't have to do either. Now, as I said, that bill was passed by three votes. But this, hurt, this comes to my a close with this. This bill, when I voted for it, I'm looking up and I'm looking up at the numbers and it's very close. And my dad, when we were growing up, became ill. The day of my sister's wedding, my oldest sister's wedding, we came home for the reception. There was a deputy sheriff at the front door with eviction papers. Handed him to my dad because he had been ill and couldn't make the house payments. And I remember what it did to my dad. And I remember he was an old, very old fashioned guy. He was gonna provide for his kids. And his wife shouldn't have to work. She works hard enough as a housewife, and by the way, they do. But he was old fashioned. And from that day to the day he died at 67, he died of a broken heart and because he drank too much. And when I voted that night on the bill, I pulled out not my voting card, but I asked the clerk for a hand card, they call it. It was green and you write your name and your district and you put yes. And on the back of it, I flipped it. And I put my dad's initials on the back of that card and I slid it to the clerk when they counted it and it passed by three votes. And let me tell you, I would trade, I wouldn't trade that vote to stay in Congress for 30 years. That vote, while this health care bill is not perfect and needs work and will work it, they'll work it, I'm sure. I was not gonna sit and watch other people have to go through what my family and other families went through every day. So these, this to me is a difference